Stalingrad class. Ooh, this could be an interesting one. This could be an interesting one. But I think it's only this and the Tillmans left for this series, so I might get them all done. And then get all the other videos I need to record. Eh, I'm not feeling like sleeping. So, Stalingrad class. Well, let's start off with Horatio. 8213. The problem with these ships is that they would be core of Soviet Navy with carrier groups and destroyers. Soviets had to resign, uh, re resign from financing land army or air force, and Russian USSR were ne re never really worth sea powers. Basically, USSR can't afford to start Navy. German Plan C was more realistic. You can't ignore reality economy, even if you are standing. Hmm. Okay. I would say, firstly, it's... It's an interesting comment, but unlike Plan Z, the Russians and the Soviets do actually, the Russians slash Soviets do actually have the infrastructure, especially with all the states they've taken over, to actually build their plan. So there is that difference. Um, that would certainly add to the realism in favor of the S Stalin's plan. As for the economics, honestly, economics and a communist central, a centrally dictated dictatorship econom economy are interesting. The same rules that might apply to other countries whilst they do apply long term and will rear their heads up and cause massive troubles long term uh, for at least a few years the dictator can tend to ignore them i do agree the army is always going to come first though army followed by air force followed by navy however that comes with a caveat you have to remember how the Soviets associated the fall and the destruction of the former system with the Los Russo Japanese War, which was in many ways, for political reasons, blamed more on the glorious loss of the fleet at the Battle of Tsushima, which meant having a strong navy was always something quite easy to justify, as it would allow them to rectify these past abuses suffered by the great and glorious Russia. Don't get me started on some of it, okay, honestly. If you're going, but that doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. I never claimed that their logic makes sense. I'm just telling you what their logic was, what their the phrase thinking. It's like when I'm talking about some of the historical officers and what they say. People sometimes go, well, that's your opinion. I'm going, no, it's actually what they wrote what they said at the time. It's not my personal opinion. It's a fun thing. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons why I avoid getting involved in politics on this channel other than in broadest terms discussing things sometimes in brew ships and same modern events. Because the problem is my natural instinct is to present both sides of the argument both sides of the case and I will do my best job to quote and present them as they presented them historically or as they are now which makes it very easy for people to try and claim that those are my opinions I'm quite honest about my politics when people ask probably on the fence spending and um, national security issues to an extent I'm somewhere to the right of Genghis Khan sorry I am because Again, it's the, whatever part of the economy you're involved in, or part of the action you're involved in, tends to be what you have the nightmares about at night, and so that's what you always justify the spending on. But I'm also involved in education, and would like that to be spent on quite well, because education matters. And I'm quite keen on there being a national health service. It's very useful when you have the number of family I have who have weird illnesses. It's just so helpful on that front, and there's so many other things which I'm rather keen on. But I also fundamentally understand that you cannot tax a country to 
prosperity. And that's a point, but you need to make sure the taxation system is fair. And those are my views. But I could also be talking and talking about Winston Churchill's political views at certain points as he espouses. And I could, you know, be mentioning those. So I don't tend to get into politics on this channel. Still though, I will say Soviet economics under Stalin is a whole subject in oh my lord Nick Vorden let's start off the slideshow Stanger class Boom, boom. For the S, I think they will complete the last two hours, maybe with tweaked engines for more speed, and maybe sell off the Alaskas to friendly powers that are closer geographically to the Soviet Union. So maybe Turkey gets an Alaska as Goban replacement. Maybe Goban gets sold to Western Germany as a museum ship that has to be kept in a condition that is usable for NATO forces. I know, unlikely, but I can dream. I mean, Gordon, that's a very, very big dream. There's going to be a lot of politics in this discussion, I can tell. <laughs> Or kind of a wild card, Chile, Argentina, Brazil. Grab one Alaska if Hawaii is completed. If that happens, maybe a North Carolina finds a way to Turkey because 35.5 knots are fine, but the Black Sea only has so much space to use them. You're forgetting one thing. You sell Turkey a battleship, you're going to have to sell Greece a battleship as well. And then you're going to have to deal with the fact that they're going to spend quite a lot of time staring at each other and possibly fighting each other. The French will keep Jean Bart and Riccolou for longer and maybe tweak their engines. For the UK, maybe the 16 inch guns for the Lion class get developed further, but a newer and more efficient hull is built. I imagine a kind of super renown. Maybe we see some carriers with updated model designers of the armoured carrier modernisations. And they only did one, victorious, and it took out the budget for everything else. The US might be interested in, better, in a better Japanese Navy, so I can see them getting some older US 8-inch cruisers. Or if the Des Moines are superseded by another auto 8-inch in class, they will be given away to Japan. I don't think that, uh, that the US trusts the Japanese with full battleships. Probably not. Probably not. Um, Scott Garner, this have South Dakotas and maybe North Carolinas and Alaskas sticking around also. Potentially. Uh, Kingbrock, if these ships are in service, the hours stay active, along with at least Vanguard, Riccolo, and perhaps even the South Dakotas uh, to defend carriers. Hmm. Uh, Sigar, in terms of chronology, where does this lay in terms of Project 23, is Project 24, D67, D65, 6.5, D12, um, Basically, let me just say this. To explain and discuss how the project numbers all relate to each other, would be an entire thesis of itself because sometimes some projects seem to start late, late than others. I think they're numbered as they're thought of, not necessarily as they're started, let alone commissioned and actually started construction. He says, and that number could well be the original project number, but you could be dealing with variations so far along the lines that it should actually probably be a new project number. It gets fun with the Soviet system. Decision, oh, oh wait, the thought occurs that although the idea of such task groups is impressive, did the 1950s era Soviet economy have the capacity to build them? They're still struggling to grow from World War II. Yeah, that's an entirely different question. Did they, the question actually is, do they have the capacity to build them and not cause themselves trouble elsewhere in their economy? The answer probably is no. The question is, will that other area of the economy affect the army or the air force? If no, then they won't care. They'll carry on doing it. If it affects the army or the air force, it's going to depend how politically connected those who are, those who are affected senior officers are. And yes, I am drinking more iron brew this evening, but that's because 
I'm currently getting the taste of dog paw out of my mouth. Which sounds weird, but... Poodle... Jump up, give me hug, paw go wrong direction, and go... Ooh. End up with paw sort of lunged in mouth a bit, and, you know, pull out quickly, but... <sighs> you can wash it out, but still the taste remains. It's just disgusting. So, iron brew it is. Um, just see, looking at these, I can't help but feel someone really, really liked the Sharnholz class and probably had a copy of the plans. The US-UK reply would be interesting. A joint build nuclear-powered Lion class, or using also loading version of 16-inch 50s? Uh, I doubt that, but that sounds like a nice idea. It's very much a pretty ship. I do agree with Rob saying. With Cobra living some more years, it's the too many butterflies. Yeah, Stalin living for any longer is... Oh, that man was not getting better with age. Uh, Lee Great, best solution would be to be a, be a bigger, nastier torpedo of six, assuming you want to keep it conventional, it is. Richard Zasa, you get kidnapped an by an Asian crazy Russian naval officer. Intelligence, freshly freed from Gulag. As you drive to his naval base, you hear how Stannis is here and he loves everything when it comes to Dhaka. He has an officer. All the iron brew you could dream of, which you're looking at, if you take his collected intel and build him his dream cruiser. It is a Wi-Fi and satellite dead zone too, so no take up, but locals can cook. His collected intel is the 2006 North Korea ballistic missile targeting system, the 1980s Chinese navigation systems, 1950s US AA systems, 1940s German rockets, 1920s UK engines, 1960s French helicopters. Big guns are all Italian. The incomplete hull of an icebreaker ship and access to or ability to recreate everything on those lists, plus all the basics after weapons and armor to fit out. He also tossed in some 1800 muzzle loading deck cannon and carronade for fun. I did say he was crazy. Long story short, what do you build? A nightmare that can be confused for a daydream. Uh, Washington Radio. I would think something like a Montana with more speed would be to build possibly nuclear powered by the US along with improved Alaska's. The last two hours would be built. Also, the US, uh, the other USN fast battleships might have kept themselves longer and not scrapped as soon as they were. Robertson, Stalingrad versus Alaska would be a, a very big fight. It would be. Raffinger. One thing that came to mind to me is the Bikini Atoll nuclear tests, especially the underwater tests. I'd be surprised if someone decided the best counter to them is a missile equipped with a nuclear depth charge launched a distance from an airplane. It would solve the arm problem and has the potential to knock out the entire task force in one go. The trouble is with nuclear weapons is once you use them once, then everyone else gets to use them as well. How long once you use those nuclear weapons before you're in a general nuclear exchange? So whilst you are not wrong, that is a solution, and I'm sure someone will come with the idea and will develop it, actually using that as the solution is an entirely different matter. <sighs> Gee, guy, in the 1950s, were there enough 15-inch BR Mark I guns left in the existence of the British to build some kind of super renown, or use the guns from King George V? Yes and yes, because you remember they have all the guns from the Queen Elizabeth, they have all the, that are remained, all the guns from Renown that remained, all the guns from the R-Class that remained, and they have all the 14-inch guns as well. Odds are they developed something better. Okay, Americans might finish Kentucky and Hawaii, maybe to revise design and trade armor for speed, potentially. Hans Roger. After the disruption of the course by successive waves of post-war purges of military, industrial, and political elites, to, uh, beginning with the Doctor's plot, Stargard crafts are eventually completed as hybrid heavy gun missile carriers with uh, with two free gun turrets placed forward, uh, equipped with um, also loading 305mm recoils ri naval rifles refined from those trialed on the Ingalls, an Orphea class destroyer, and magazine fed navalized SSN 25 and SN 125 launchers aft. That sounds disturbingly likely. Um, some old guy from 1976. The hull looks like a old, like, looks a lot like a hipper class cruiser. Fast, but not fast enough to run a, outrun a missile. Considering the SN2 didn't enter the service until officially until 1960, practically add some years, and NATO were behind that in development missiles. Uh, development missiles weren't really a factor. 
Besides which, being able to kill it in war is one thing. After, of course, you found it. Finding it in peace is a completely different issue, and just as with the reactivation of Iowa's to balance the Kirov's in the 1980s, these sort of required response to, to balance the diplomatic effect. You want to see an Alaska fight a Sangrad? Who wins? I'm not sure. Um, but did Sun understand Wayne's world of science and technology? Did the Sun understand this thing called radar? I could see a 15,000 ton cruiser with six 9.2 inch 50 gun, uh, 50 car guns builders response. Now, if I just knew how to get the Steam version UAD to export ship designs, you're thinking a war fight. He was thinking winning the peace. Might as well. True, as answer for combat, but there's also numbers. You could build a lot more of these. You could. My coach, if Stalin is longer, would he take the risk of basing missiles on Cuba? And if he did, would he blink first? Stalin is a very different beast. Would he base missiles on Cuba? Possibly. But that would be pre de factionism, which allows a lot of information, intelligence assets to, sleep, to be sneaked into the Soviet Union that, uh, for the factionism that grows up after his death. And the infighting and the you know the different people will string for power to take over from him. So um, if he hasn't died, you might well not have had that. In which case, a whole different history could run out. A whole different history. If they thought it necessary, the US had two more or less incomplete hours until the late 1950s that could have been added to the fleet. There was even an extra Alaska hull that hung around in case of, well, needing them. Um, Stalinium. Mm -hmm. Andrew Cox. And this is a long discussion that goes on between Force 1454 and Andrew Cox. And when I say long discussion, I mean it's a long discussion. And I didn't even get involved. And I haven't even pressed the read more on all these, because you can read more. 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 So, it is an interesting discussion. It is a really interesting discussion between Andrew Cox and Force EA1454. And I would say the most discussion is about what kind of carriers are chosen, and I would agree. It's probably the 52 carrier, the 1952 carrier design, which they were looking at. Um... And the thing is, it depends when the battleships come into service. So, if it's coming into the mid-1950s, there are still the King George V's and Vanguard is still around. There are still a couple of King George V's and a Vanguard round. So they still have some battleships around. So that's going to bite them their initial time. If the Americans are reactivating the 16-inch 50 program, and the British still have the facilities to build and repair their ba their guns, their 15-inch and the 14-inch guns. I could see the British getting their 15-inch guns out of storage. They might talk to the Americans and go for a joint 16-inch program and a new 16-inch gun. That could well be a NATO project, a new 16-inch gun for France, Britain, and America. Um... I do see where you're coming from with the counties, force here, and the various things. Uh, but I would also say Vanguard isn't too expensive to run. Let me put it this way. 
Vanguard is too expensive to run in the context of the time it is. One of the things you have to remember is that the British increasingly focus on the Central Front as their thing they can contribute to. Because in many ways, they don't need to do more than be, provide an anti-submarine warfare fleet for NATO on the north and the northern coast. That's what they're focusing in on. If you have the Soviets providing a full and balanced fleet, and honestly, if they're producing the Stalingrads, they're going to have aircraft carriers and other things as well, that changes that context. Suddenly, the Royal Navy, the fleet, becomes an important part of both the peacetime conflict management and risk management of the Soviet Navy and what they're doing around the world, and the wartime role. That's going to change some of the funding discussions. Not all of them, not all of them, but it's going to change some of them. Uh, the British end up focusing everything on contributing to the British Army of the Rhine. And in this scenario, you might have a smaller British army out of the Rhine. They might even try and make it a British and Canadian army of the Rhine. Or something like that. Because remember, Canada's a member of NATO as well. Uh, I.e. they might try and pull in others to provide extra forces to supplement it, whilst the Royal Navy gets more funding to maintain a slightly larger force. I think Vanguard could well be kept in service for a while. I also think what you could see, and I notice I don't think you've really discussed this, but what I could see them doing is going for some sort of hybrid vessels. Um, I don't think the 6-inch cruisers are really going to cut it. And I don't, especially not in the presence mission, deterrence mission, the submarines are going to do the killing. Yes, you know, this is the thing. Again, you, the, the weapons that you can kill it with are many and varied. You can sink it with a buccaneer. You can you sink it with a submarine. You can sink it with a missile. Those are all true, but that's what you can do in wartime. In peacetime, you need to manage it. You need to manage its presence. You need to offset it. Vanguard is a very useful status ship for that kind of work. But if they don't go down the developing a new gun route with the Americans, I think you would see the Royal Navy actually build some new cruisers. And hold with me here. I think you could see some new cruisers with some very interesting guns. I think they could be 9.2 inch guns. And I think what you would do is you'd have a cross between the county missile system, county class missile system, and a vessel which had extensive command and control facilities, flag facilities, so of course including extensive entertainment facilities. 9.2 inch guns, loss of 4 or 4.5 inch guns, and hangar. And I think you would see that. I think that's what the Royal Navy would have. What would be interesting would be to see if they still retain such a similar vessel in service to this day. I think you might end up seeing what I would call a NATO cruiser as a response to it. And you've got, sad to say, but I can't help thinking the 50s, the, in the 50s, the response wouldn't have been an arm piercing missile, but a nuclear one. A naval ice anti ship genie would be a good option. Yes, but again, everyone does understand the moment you let out the nuclear weapons go, you're starting a nuclear war. And that's, you have no control of that genie. I said, well, more people get sent to the gulags. A Stalin is a, it was a tin pot, they apparently a dispot. And a Sango class battle cruisers get built. Yeah, it would maybe throw a huge wrench in dissolving the British Empire. It would cause some interesting things there. Laskers are still around, although out of commission. I think I mentioned that. Uh, Paul from Chicago. I'm increasing the opinion the Acacia class were the most key ship of the 20th century. Um. 
We'll see. I think I'm supposed to be doing those at some point soon. I think the Acacias are. Ah. Nice reference. So the Soviet Union killing off the Sovetsky Soyuz, it showed the West that they can never build they can never build battleships and theirs weren't needed. Is that right? Mm. It showed the West they weren't going to build battleships, and therefore, as I've me I mentioned in the recent video, uh, who killed the battleship, it made it far less likely. Because just principal justification for a battleship is all these other things may kill a battleship, and someone very helpfully listed all the other ways a battleship may be killed. In the comments, they talked about submarines, they talked about air attacks, and went, there you go, it may be killed. Look, all these ones have been killed by it. I mean, yeah, they have. I was sort of going, that's the whole point. The whole point of comment is, those may kill it, but the thing that we can be certain will kill it is another big battleship. And yeah, you, you can argue with that logic, Trust me, I spent a lot of my time arguing with that logic. But that's the sort of logic that a lot of politicians enjoy. A lot of politicians enjoy. And it comes up a lot. Um, I've had that discussion over aircraft carriers. I've had that discussion over nuclear submarines. I've had that discussion over... Satellites. It comes up a lot. It's the kind of logic which is loved by... A certain version of speaker, I guess. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you found it interesting. And I think the comment response video is actually longer than the video was. Let me just see. Um, yeah, the video is 27 minutes 49. And this is... Actually, no, it isn't. It's going to be shorter than it. Just... This will be roughly 27 minutes. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, and uh, I'm going to go quickly because uh, before I get it to 26 minutes, 27 minutes 50.